Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this Facebook Live Town Hall. We are talking COVID-19, and we'll, we will be trying to address as many of your questions as we can. Here in South Carolina, we are almost four months into the pandemic and partial shutdown, and unfortunately, things are only getting worse. For the, first, for the past two weeks, confirmed cases of COVID-19 have skyrocketed. Until yesterday, South Carolina was reporting 1,000 new cases and higher per day. The highest yet, 1,836 cases, which were reported on the 4th of July, Saturday. Right now, our total number of cases in South Carolina, 47,214. Total number of deaths, 838. We have a team of doctors with us now to tell us where we stand with treatment and prevention and what's next as we battle this disease. Many of you may remember Dr. Ebony Hilton. She's a South Carolina native who works in Virginia in the area of critical care and anesthesiology at the University of Virginia Charlottesville. Dr. Paula Orr, also a familiar face, uh, on previous panels with us. She's an OBGYN practicing in North Charleston. Joining us for the first time is Dr. Valerie Scott, a family physician with Roper St. Francis Healthcare in Mount Pleasant, and also new to our panel, Dr. Bernadette Blunt, the medicine director for Piedmont Midtown Columbus Regional in Georgia. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Now, Dr. Blunt, I want to start with you because you and your team are doing something very innovative at the hospital system in Georgia to try to fight the coronavirus and come up with a strategy. Tell us about that. Hi, yes. Um, when the coronavirus first started in Columbus, Georgia, um, we only were seeing maybe four or five patients a day. Um, the outbreak at that time had occurred in Atlanta and then a large outbreak in Albany that resulted from two patients that went to the same funeral and spread it rapidly to a <laughs> Southwest Georgia hospital. And so we were getting a lot of their overflow patients. And during the beginning of the epidemic, um, the patients were immediately being placed on ventilators and taking up a lot of hospital resources. And the hospitals were very unclear with direction. Um, they were at that point trying to discourage the providers, the nurses from even wearing PPE because they figured that it would evoke hysteria in the public and it's changed almost every month, every couple of weeks to no one wear PPE in hallways to now everyone is required to do so. And um, as the medical director here, I definitely formed a task force with mainly our COVID units and trying to retrofit the hospital to have negative pressure rooms and to have training for how to um, put on your PP going in and out of the rooms, how to train our providers with different treatment protocols, how to institute proning protocols to kind of make sure that our patients have the best um, opportunity to be able to be discharged safely and alive from the hospital. So it started from four patients to, um, over Memorial Day weekend with Georgia opening up in Florida, South Carolina, we went from four patients to over 67 and we are the high uh, volume hospital right now in the Piedmont system. So social distancing was effective and now that most of the states are open, it's becoming um, very scary and we're running out of resources again. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the leadership um, that you're providing for the hospital system in Georgia. One of the other things that you do is, are you one of the people before someone is placed on a ventilator? Are you one of the people who was consulted? So um, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, I definitely control that and I'm in contact every single day with the infectious disease specialist and the intensive care specialist. So normally it's a stepwise strategy of requiring higher levels of oxygenation. And so the goal and the strategies now are to try to avoid intubation at all costs because of the higher mortality once you're on the vent. So they pretty much go through me and I contact ICU and you know proning patients. There's a lot of anxiety. And if we're able to kind of calm the patient down sometimes through IV medications, we're able to keep them off the ventilator. But it's definitely a strategy now to you know, avoid going in the ICU and avoid going on the ventilator as long as possible. And just recognizing when the tipping point is going to occur. 
All right, thank you very much. Definitely a heavy burden there. Um, Dr. Hilton, let's, um, let's go to you now. And I'm trying to pull up my Facebook page on my tablet over here so I can see some of the questions that are coming up. So I'm working on that in the meantime. Dr. Hilton, bring us up to speed. So where are we and how much farther do we have to go? Right, um, unfortunately, I feel like we, on a whole, we haven't made too terrible much of progress. Um, what we know is that um, since the reopening of our nation, we've seen several states have shown that they weren't necessarily prepared for what reopening brings about in the middle of a mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, in order for us to be safe, we have to have what we talked about months ago now, um, the three T's of testing, tracing, and treatment options in place. And right now, um, yes, we, we've tested over 38 million people. Um, we have 320 million people in America, though. Um, that being number one. Number two is that just because someone tests negative on Monday doesn't mean they're not going to come into contact with someone on Tuesday that's going to make them positive. And so we have to have a, a, um, a strategy by which we will have availability of these tests over and over and over again for that same person. Um, so we're, and we're starting to see the impact of that. If we're looking at the southern states in general, um, you know, we have Florida who, who is kind of taking the lead on this and champion, you know, the, the ways not to kind of do this. But um, right now in South Carolina, since reopening 67 days ago, we have an increase of over 800% in our COVID-19 cases. And what does that mean? Um, we're seeing the impact on our hospitalization rates, right? At this point in, in the low country, the Midlands, the upstate, we're looking at between 65 to 75% of all acute hospital beds being occupied. And what, is that, what does that mean for outside of COVID? That means if you're having heart attacks and strokes and all these other illnesses that are still happening, regardless if there's a pandemic or not, is making those, those resources less available. So um, we, we have to figure out a way of preventing things that we can actually prevent, which is leaning heavily on the public to do their part so we can do our part in the healthcare system. And I know that makes it tough for all of you as physicians who are trying to do your jobs, as you said, to treat those people who are not uh, dealing with COVID-19. Dr. Orr, I know that your office had slowly reopened, was open for maybe just a matter of weeks. And I know that recently your office just closed again uh, because of the increases in the cases. How are you managing your patient load and helping women with their other needs during this pandemic? So, so actually, like you said, and we, we haven't closed completely, but what we've had to do is shift our focus to um, treating patients or, or identifying patients that are positive. So, so what I do is I see half the day, I see patients that have problems where I have to physically touch them. And then I do telehealth for the other 90% of patients, but we are offering testing at our, at our, at my office. And so I'm seeing more and more patients that are coming in requesting tests. And so like Dr. Hilton said, you know, I think I, the thing that's unique to me, which is different from Dr. Blount and Dr. Hilton, is that I'm on the outpatient side of it. Mm -hmm. So my responsibility is to try to educate people so that they don't get to visit Dr. Hilton and Dr. Blount. Um, the challenge with that is that people are still, unfortunately, in South Carolina because there was this sense of we can return back to normal. People have sort of done that. Um, and then they get exposed because it's not a matter of if it happens, it's when it happens, it's going to happen. And then they are in hysteria to come in and get tested. <laughs> and so what we're doing is we are offering tests. Um, you know, the ideal thing is not to test people like the day after you found out you were exposed to somebody because a lot what we're discovering is that if you test too soon, you're more likely to get a false negative test. So what we're doing is recommending people, particularly if they're asymptomatic, to wait seven days to come in and be tested to allow there to be a more likelihood of a positive test. Um, there's still a lot of misinformation. People are wanting, they don't want to have the swab, they want to have the antibody test. Um, but they have no known exposures and somebody told them that that was the thing to do and, you know, or people are, you know, doing things at home like drinking hot uh, lemon tea, thinking <laughs> that that is going to somehow ward off the virus. 
So I'm on the opposite end of Dr. Blount and Dr. Dr. Hilton. And, and that's where the challenge really, really is. And one final thing, because I'm a gynecologist, I just have to mention this. It's kind of like having an STD, right? Mm -hmm. So you get exposed to somebody and then you find out that your test is negative. But if you go back and do the same behaviors, then there's a possibility that your test is going to be positive again. So it's mm -hmm. once you have a negative test, then you have to take the responsibility of avoiding those behaviors that put you in the high risk category to begin with. And that's where we're struggling in South Carolina because people are yeah. still going to weddings because it's only 50 people there. So they think it's okay. Or people are still going to events where there's more people than they should be exposed to people they don't know and don't know what they've been doing. And so then the risk is there. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Scott, I want to bring you in on this discussion now because as a family physician, I know that a lot of people contact you first if they think they have been exposed or if they are di displaying some symptoms, they will contact you to say, what should I do? Um, how has all of this been playing out in your role as a family physician? Oh, certainly COVID has changed the way we practice medicine a great deal. Just like with Dr. Orr, we're doing a lot of our work virtually. And we're trying very hard to keep our staff and other patients from coming into contact with people who have COVID. You know, it's inevitable. We have uh, frequent times we find out we saw a patient three days later, they're diagnosed with COVID and it's happening over and over. But we're very, very careful in wearing our masks and having our patients wear masks. So we've been very lucky and nobody has uh, contracted uh, COVID in our office uh, through patients. What I wanted to build on what Dr. Orr said is, you know, it's the people we come into contact with and they have noticed recently that just being in a casual conversation with someone is one of the most risky behaviors. So, you know, just because you know this person, you've gone to church with them, or you even work with them, you still need to wear your mask. Uh, we're getting the COVID from our coworkers, not our patients, and or from in the wild, if you will. You know, when you go out to the uh, other places, so and you bring it back to the office. So that's super important. We're all wearing our masks anytime we're outside of the office, and that's so so important. And that's what we're teaching our patients. So when I encounter them for their follow-up, for their blood pressure. We talk about why, how are you protecting yourself against COVID? And we discuss the, you know, the myths about masks don't work. Well, of course they work. Please wear them, you know, please wear them is our message over and over and over. Then we talk to people who were, as you said, I was in an event and someone was positive or someone three offices over is positive. You know, realistically, that's probably not a significant exposure. A great experience, you know, great opportunity to teach people, and we are testing exposures. Uh, we do like to wait, you know, seven days or so. But importantly, if you have a significant exposure, you need to quarantine. You can't be going to work while you're waiting for your results or waiting for us to test you. That's just not going to work. I just spoke to a guy just a 30 minutes ago who'd been going to work with a fever. Really? Come on now. We have to take responsibility for our neighbors. And yeah, I understand work is important and we go crazy for at home, but you got to stay home. Yeah, very true. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're getting lots of questions and lots of comments. So I'm trying to write them down so I don't forget. Okay, so first of all, lots of questions about schools. All of you are doctors. Um, Dr. Orr, you still have children who are in school. How do you all feel about reopening the schools? Can we reopen schools safely starting next month? Um, and if so, how are we going to do that? Anybody can jump in. I'm very nervous about that. I, I don't know how that would look. I mean, they're talking about spacing children and uh, wearing masks, but how do they get there on the bus? We have enough trouble already as it is. I, I just think it may be premature myself. 
I think I think we know exactly how it'll look if you look at Israel, if you look at um, South Korea. So so this is a thing. United States, we're trying to act like we're the only ones in this battle, or that we were <laughs> the first ones to go through this. We have an entire globe that's going through this at the same exact moment. And there are certain countries that have done things right, and then there's us. So I'm gonna start with the people <laughs> who've done things right. Um, I've seen a lot of comments in the, in the chat about you know, send our kids to school and, and someone made a comment about more people die from car wrecks, which is not true. Just to give a little aside, 37,000 people in 2016 died from car wrecks. We've had 130,000 people die from COVID-19 just in the first six months. We've had more people die from COVID-19 in these last six months than we had people die of AIDS for the first four years. So this is not something that we can compare and act like we, we you know, that this is some little aside. What we know in South Carolina right now, the mortality rate is 1.79%, right? And that's, that's keeping in mind that we weren't testing all people who were dying earlier on. So our, our mortality rate is probably a lot higher than that. But that, given that number though, there's 5.1 million people in South Carolina. If 1.79% of those die, we're looking at 120, 102 to 110,000 people. That's Chesterfield, Chester, and Clarendon County. All those people, go ahead and sacrifice them to the gods for COVID-19. That's what we're that's what we're up against. So when we're talking about reopening schools, what we have to know is that yes, our children, thank God, they tend to be protected. But we know there is a syndrome called multi multi system inflammatory syndrome, of where kids are literally having an inflammatory process that impacts their heart, the the arteries that go to their heart, and impacts their lungs, and impacts their basically everywhere along their vascular tree, and what does that have for long-term consequences? We don't know. But the other thing we know is that even if the kid does not develop that multi-system inflammatory syndrome, if they get infected, we know the kids bring things with them and they are cute and they are adorable and they are vectors. And so that child mm -hmm. can't help but want to hug and squeeze when they come home from school. If they picked it up from their classmate, Susie or, or Tommy, then they're bringing it home to you and you do have a pre-existing condi condition called age. And your, and your grandparents that you're, um, you know, that are watching the kid at home um, for you until you get off work, they have pre-existing conditions. So although the child may be okay, those that come into contact with that child may not be. So it's, it's very naive of us to think that this won't have a, a bigger impact. And again, if we look at Israel and we look at um, South Korea that has, I think South Korea still has deaths of maybe 300s, um, 400s. They've done a fantastic job at keeping their numbers down. But when they reopened their schools, they saw their cases start to jump because of the kids, because kids, they hug each other and they want to touch each other's face and hair and that's what they do. And when they are doing that, they are transmitting this, this virus amongst themselves and then bringing it back into the home. So if the schools don't have those same three ways of testing, tracing, and treatment in place for the schools too, to say that, hey parents, you have to tell us if someone in your home has a fever, you can't just bring your kid to school because you want to. There has to be some accountability and tracing because this, this virus does not care if you're in the first grade or you graduated 13 years ago. It can get to all of us, so that's mm -hmm. my opinion. Our educators are definitely up against a, a tough battle there. Uh, Dr. Blunt, what do you say? I say that I'm concerned about people going to school and being in close contact unless there is a way that we're testing all the teachers, all the students prior to starting school. I just don't feel comfortable because we already are actually running out of actually testing in a lot of places because more people are getting tested. So the labs are actually running out of reagents in my state. So it's going to be a challenge both as an outpatient with the students and, you know, like Dr. Hilton said, it's the cute children that are coming home and it's attacking the parents and the grandparents and the silent transmissibility is what's really um, killing the adults. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I'm really concerned about opening up too quickly and not having um, consistent measures of even spacing children, even if they are tested. And then how are they going to be retested after the first month? 
Are they doing temperature checks every day? Like, I'm just concerned overall about the safety. Dr. Orr, I know you've got college and uh, children who are still in high school. What do you do as a mom? How do you feel? Well, first, the, the other thing I want to add into it is that there is the component that affects the kids, but we also have a significant um, number of our uh, educator core that is older and has, um, you know, um, uh, pre are predisposed to the infection. So what happens when they're in the classroom and they're teaching the kids who, whose parents have taken them to a cookout the weekend before, they come back to school on Monday, they now have COVID and they're asymptomatic and doing well. And now they're exposing that, you know, 50 year old teacher with diabetes. So there's that component too, is that keeping the, the teachers safe is just as important as, as keeping the, the students safe. And I get it, you know, I'm fortunate enough because I have older kids. So for the most part, they can kind of do their thing and they can kind of manage on their own. The challenge comes in when you are a parent who has younger children um, you have to go to work or you have to try to work from home and also manage, you know, the workload that's being provided for them. So to me, the smart thing for these districts to do, and I, by no mean I'm outside of my lane for sure, but they have to have a, a, a plan B. Because again, it's not a matter of if, it's when. So when you open the schools and you discover that 15 of your kids in the school are now positive, despite doing all the things, you know, the temperature checks, the assessing people's whereabouts and tracing as best you can, because unfortunately people are not being forthcoming about what they're doing. Um, and you discover that you've got this group of kids in the school, the school's gonna end up shutting down anyway. And then how do, what do you do then? How do you navigate that? So that, that it's, there's so many complexities that need to be examined around that. It can't just simply be, let's open up the schools. There has to be, and this is what we're gonna do when this happens, when it happens, not if it happens, but when it happens. Mm -hmm. All right, um, doctors, yeah. let me ask you this. Um, we're getting some folks who, who still don't believe that you know, this whole thing is real, you know, that we're all going to be fine, that we don't need to wear a mask, that you don't need to be so concerned about washing your hands. What do you say to people with the, with the numbers we're getting in every day between cases and deaths? What do you say to those people who were like, oh, this is not real and we just need to open everything back up and everything will be fine? So what I say is those people probably haven't experienced this firsthand yet. But they mm -hmm. will. Someone in their family is going to get it and they're going to get sick and maybe even unfortunately pass away. So the experiences that I've had with people who um, make that argument are people who've not had personal experiences with it yet. But when they do <laughs> is when their minds will change. And it's just a matter of when, it ha when it's going to happen. It's not, not if. So I, I try not to, to argue with people who are following more the politics than the science behind this, because unfortunately, mm -hmm. this has been turned into a political issue and not a public health issue, which is ridiculous, but that's the fact. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that we are in a public health crisis. And whether or not you feel like it personally impacts you and you want to go to the bar or you want to send your kid back to school, the reality of it is, is that it is affecting all of us. And unfortunately, we have to look at the greater good and not just what's happening in individual households. And it's a, and it's a will for ignorance. Um, at this point, I can't even say it's when they know someone because everyone knows someone who's had COVID. Uh, if not personally, you know someone on TV because as Donald Trump has said, there's been several people within his administration that have tested positive. So this is not like we were in the same situation back in January or February where you you know, it's like, oh, was there someone over there? Uh, we have seven, in, in Florida alone right now, 7,000 students, 7,000 kids have tested positive for COVID-19, 7,000. Um, and what South Carolina has to recognize and, and realize is that South Carolina is, how do you say it? I love my home um, state. Um, we do a, a lot of things that I think are fantastic. Um, but what we do know is that we are, we are medically underserved and there are several counties without a single hospital. We have to, when we're comparing numbers and, and I saw someone say, um, how are we running out of tests so soon? Because we don't have hospitals to allocate those test supplies to. And we have to think we're sharing a, um, a national supply of this stock, 
right? And so when these supplies, when these cases are, are showing up in Florida, in Texas, in California, which has happens to be the most populated states in our entire nation, those resources are going to go to those states first. Testing resources, masks and gowns, um, medication supply, all of that's going to go to where the demand is, which right now, um, I got a about lower on that list. Down, all on live so, um, I wasn't able. But I think Roddy is. Um, that's all right. I'm not, they can't see Roddy, me. I'm just coordinating and making sure it's going right. Let me see if I can try to. We can see Roddy. <laughs> But um, but that being the case, behind the scenes, so Roddy, if you can hear us, we are hearing you. So can you mute mute? Send her text. I think she's on a call. Right. I'm sorry. But the um, but the main thing is, is that we have to really start to um, to assess like what have people done before us? What did they do that was great, and what did they do that didn't quite um, make the mark? And we don't want to put ourselves in a position in South Carolina where um, we truly don't have the resources to, to make up for it. Um, people will unnecessarily die. Before COVID, South Carolina was already ranked, I think, 35th in the nation as far as health outcomes. We, we are already on a crutch. We got a crutch on one side. COVID will be the final wheelchair move if we don't approach this in the correct way. And, and we have to set egos aside. This is not a Republican versus Democrat thing. This is not a rich versus poor thing. C coronavirus does not care what's in your bank account. It does not care if you wear a hat or not. We, we got to start thinking smart. Um, and there's things that we can do that are very simple that can help to slow this down so we can get ourselves back on track. But it's gonna take everyone participating in that plan. Okay, I have another question for all of you. We get uh, lots of comments, lots of uh, phone calls, uh, Facebook messages every day into our newsroom from people who were saying that people at my job are getting sick and my company is not shutting down and I'm concerned for my safety, what can I do? Now we are uh, reaching out to uh, DHEC to see what answers we can find to find out legally um, what remedies there are, but what can these folks do? Who do they report this to? And, and what options do they have short of just saying, okay, I'm not gonna come to work and I'm gonna risk getting fired to protect my health. Dr. Blunt? I think the reality is, um, depending on your job. If you are asymptomatic, you're not showing any signs or symptoms, at least at my hospital, you're still required to come to work. And I tell people to treat everyone else like they are infected. So I wear my mask from the time I get out of my car to the, the entire day. I have Lysol hand sanitizer. Don't touch any door handles. Like treat everyone like everyone is infected and like this is the most contagious disease on the planet and protect yourself. And you're gonna have to live, you're gonna have to make a live and you're gonna have to feed your family. So be smart and mm -hmm. do everything that you can. Wash your hands before, every time you put anything in your mouth, before you touch your face. Just be cautious, but go to work. Keep your mask on, stay safe, be um, vigilant. If you see anybody too close to you, you distance if they refuse to. If you see a crowd of people that no one's wearing a mask, don't mm -hmm. go in there. Just okay, protect doctor. yourself. And also remind your coworkers to put their mask on um, because most places mandate that now. Some people will be like, oh, we're around each other all the time. Yeah, no, put your mask on, then we can talk. Um, I mean, we even stay six feet apart even with our mask on. You know, it can't hurt to give just a little more space. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear some people, you know, who, they don't want to follow the rules, but it's sort of, you know, they say, you know, oh, we're, we're, we're in hysteria over this disease, but it's just like getting a cold, um, getting pink eye, or even getting the flu. I wouldn't want to get those things from you either. So if you were sick, I would appreciate you were telling me, hey, I think I might be sick. I'm not feeling well, so don't get close to me. So it's just a matter of, it is a matter of common courtesy, and it is not hysteria, because there are other illnesses that I wouldn't want to get from folks. And unfortunately, I have gotten those things that I've just mentioned <laughs> from other people, because they didn't make me aware that they were sick. So 
if if you are that person who was sick, yeah, please, just out of common courtesy, it's not hysteria, please just stay home. And not everyone's immune system may be as healthy as yours. They may not be able to recover as quickly as you can. So just common courtesy. Um, Dr. Orr, what do you say uh, to folks who were like, my job won't shut down, and we know that we have positive cases here. What can they do? What do you recommend? Well, I, I think um, it's just like Dr. Scott said, I think you have to take personal responsibility for yourself. I, I think at this point, everybody has their own personal stock of Lysol and gloves <laughs> and everybody has a mask. And the bottom line is you do the best that you can do to keep yourself and everybody else safe. Um, if you have to go to work, you have to go to work because that's a whole nother pandemic in and of itself too. the unemployment rate in the country right now. Um, and but you but know that you're going in trusting that your coworkers are doing the right thing, the responsible thing. Um, I think I own my own business. And so one of the things that I've encouraged my employees to do is not to go out on the weekends. And, if, you know, if I know it's hard, you know, we, we live in a state that, you know, that everything is open, you can go get your nails and you can go get a massage and all that. But just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Um, and, you know, so just know that if you do that, you're taking a risk and you're putting the people who you work with and the people who you live with basically at risk. And, you know, I, I saw a comment, someone asked if, um, why don't immune suppressed people stay at home? We have to remember not all people, um, we consider, yes, people who are on cancer and, and chemotherapy agents, yes, they're immune suppressed. But guess who else is? Um, pregnant women. Right. Um, in pregnancy, your body, you're literally carrying another human inside of you. And that overwhelming response makes you immune suppressed um, to a certain sense. So are we going to ask all pregnant women to also stay home? Are we going to ask, you know, it's, it's one of these things of where we're saying, hey, people with, um, you know, any type of medical condition, you just stay home so the rest of us can continue to live <laughs> and not wear a mask. And that's just not simply, that's not what we should do as the United States of America. But the second point I'm going to make is oftentimes we keep on hearing this, this rhetoric of, oh, it's only sick people that have to worry about it. What we know for sure is that there are healthy, completely healthy people who are now having major strokes related to COVID-19, where they can no longer move a complete side of their body that are 30 and 40 years old. This is real, we, you know, which brings to another topic. We keep on reporting this mortality rate, which is which we do need to talk about. People are dying, um, yes, but we're not talking about the recovered. And, and I want to talk about this because oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, what about the recovery? There's more people recovering. Yeah, they are. And in that recovered group of people, the, we are listing people who have had major strokes, who've had major heart attack and now are with heart failure, who've had major damage to their kidneys and now for the rest of life have to be on dialysis machines, who've had permanent damage to their lungs and for the rest of life now have to be with oxygen. We saw a young lady had to have a, a double lung transplant because she had COVID-19. Young, young lady now has to be on immunosuppression for the rest of life because she had to receive someone else's lung to, to make it. We've seen people lose arms and legs because COVID-19 causes you to form blood clots. And so those people are now going to be completely disabled. So yes, we're labeling them on the, the type of a screen that says recovered, but there are some things that may be worse than death, right? And having a major stroke might be one of those for some people. So again, it's, I think people need to, um, to allow science to actually rule and let egos and, and, and wants, um, they have to subside because right now biology does not care how you feel. It doesn't. And, and this virus does not care for sure. Um, and, and the other thing too, to add on to what uh, Dr. Hilton just said is that there's also what we don't know, right? So there are people who have had it who've done well, who've recovered, we still don't know yet what the long-term health complications may be for those people if they may develop chronic lung disease later on. So even those people who are healthy and did well and didn't have to be uh, hospitalized or intubated, we, we, we don't know what we don't know about that. I'm, I'm glad also, um, one of the risk factors that we don't talk about commonly is obesity. And if you think about it, our state has got a lot of people who suffer from obesity. We can't have all of those people stay home. I mean, people with BMIs over 35 
um, Nobody would be out. Or half of our population <laughs> or more. So, you know, we forget that, that um, that puts you at risk. Yeah. And those are the people that I'm seeing that are honestly the ones young and old that are dying the most is our morbidly obese population of any age and of any race. They are having worse outcomes. Yeah. Dr. Blunt, you mentioned young people, so let's talk about it. You know, we are seeing so many more reports now of younger folks, those 40 and younger who are now contracting COVID-19. Let's talk about that, the impact on them, and basically the reason they are probably contracting this disease. So at least what I've seen and um, have admitted at least since Memorial Day, I've definitely had a lot of 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, even 20-year-olds that have gone to the beach, like everyone I know that has been to some place in Florida. Um, they've had graduation <laughs> parties, and the majority of the time, they are coming in with milder symptoms, but a lot of them are, to be, of course, admitted, they're still requiring oxygen. A lot of them are having um, nausea, vomiting, you know, loss of taste and smell, GI upset, and they are still being hospitalized. I've had probably three deaths from people under the age of 40, but they were, they had no pre-existing conditions other than um, obesity. I had one of the medical residents that um, was in the hospital for 14 days because of severe lung injury and impairment, was able to recover and go home, but was a thin, very healthy person. So young people are being more cavalier and they're presenting later and then they're, you know, requiring prolonged hospitalizations that you know when they come in so late because they think oh it's nothing it's fine and then they spread it and now i have whole families now in my hospital and the parents i've lost one set of parents in the last four families because the child brought it home to the parents they were living with and it's scary mm -hmm. Wow, if that's not a message for our young folks to please, please be careful when you go out and about. I don't know what is. Um, let's also talk about, are we in a second wave now? Is the second wave yet to come? Or are we still just dealing with the first wave? First wave. First wave. Um, we are very much on the first wave. And um, and I think also in this this talk to, um, if we can speak on later, the, the presence of antibodies, because I know a lot of people are going to probably say, well, if we're having these infection rates, aren't we getting closer to herd immunity? So we can talk about that maybe later. But yeah, we're, we're definitely um, still very much on the first wave. And if, if someone wants to talk about that, I can um, try to find a, um, a picture of the graph of what our cases are looking like that I can post into the comment section on Facebook so people can see what I mean by we're still on that first hump. I'll be on this. All right, yeah. very good. So we're still in our first wave and things are very, very serious and getting uh, even um, more severe by the day. Like I said, our past two weeks, we've had cases higher than 1,000 every single day. That was so incredible for us and so scary for us. You know, one thing people are always saying that our numbers are going up because we're testing more often and we are testing more often, but the ratio of the number of positive cases to those that are negative has also gone up dramatically. In our system, we were running about two to 4% positive rates earlier, about a month or so ago. And last week it was 24% of the people tested were positive. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are delayed as well, right? Yeah. So because on average, it's taken, I know in the private labs, it's taken about seven to 10 days to get the results back. So what you're seeing right now are the numbers from likely seven to 10 days ago. I mean, I know at some of the Correct. hospitals like MUSC, you know, they can get faster turnarounds, but in the private labs, this, this, is, this is last week's test that you're seeing. Right, and so it's hard to act on that information. Correct. With, uh, Correct. Correct. And so, the same with hospitalizations. They're, they'll be delayed because usually you don't end up in the hospital when you first get it. Yeah. So we and, still need to be careful out there. As you all started this uh, session, we still need to be wearing our mask. Uh, we still need to be washing our hands a lot. Now, I do have a question for you all. I got to admit, and doctors, you know, you all have been ahead of this game um, 
ahead of this game before us because you have to do this on a normal basis anyway. But I got to tell you, I'm going to be honest. I'll speak for the audience. It's doggone hard breathing in these things. And I'm kind of trying <laughs> to figure out, you know, the best way to put it so I can breathe. It won't steam up my glasses. Um, what suggestions do you have for those of us who are not used to wearing a mask to help us to adjust to it, to keep ourselves safe? Any, any simple suggestions for us? Stay at home. Um, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Wilson, I have to come to work. I wouldn't what? be able to do this if I weren't here. So I have to be here around some of my other coworkers. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, I got to wear this thing. So how can I wear it effectively and still breathe? If you, if uh, some of the masks have the little um, wiring that you can kind of form to your yeah, nose. Like that. But honestly, just, just know that that, um, that mask is, is definitely useful and that it at least creates a so people ask why do we have to wear this mask it doesn't filter out the virus of which it does the aerosolized the the very fine particles that you can't see that mask will not filter out however what we're trying to accomplish with that mask is that when you cough with those large droplets that you see splatter on glass for instance we're trying to keep that from being able to go out and get directly into someone else's mouth and or into their nose or into their eyes. You can contract it through your eyes too, by the way. Um, oh, that's another story. But um, we're trying to prevent that large spray um, from being able to go. So wearing that mask, at least until you get to wherever you're going, if you're gonna be around anyone, is important. Um, as far as breathing, so those simple masks that you, that you um, have there, we literally, as far as anesthesiologists, OBGYNs, when we're, when we're um, doing surgeries and procedures, we literally wear that all the time. Like in, in the operating room, if I am putting you to sleep for a surgery, if you're having uh, a brain surgery or that can last five to 10 hours, if I am in your room the entire time that you're under anesthesia, in order for me not to be able to infect your back that we're cutting on so you can have your surgery on your back, um, I wear that mask. To, to keep my germs to myself and not infect your body. Um, and so, yeah, you can do it. It is it's not the most comfortable thing. You know, I hear these kind of conspiracy theories that you're breathing oh. in toxins and it's going to kill you. Yeah, I you have enough oxygen. I graduated right. medical school in 2008. I've been wearing a mask consistently since then. And it's been 12 years. I haven't passed out. I haven't had carbon dioxide poisoning. Um, I forget what other things they're saying you'll get from wearing a mask. Um, no, and, and I would offer to those people then, are you suggesting if you have surgery and your body is flayed open for us to fix something inside of you, do you want everyone in that room not to wear a mask and potentially infect, infect you and give you a, a major you know, infection and sepsis? And I would guarantee they would say no. So do the public a favor and do your part so we can get back to normal quickly by us stopping the spread of this virus but right now our numbers are going up 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 that's not so, the way so i want to say something so doctor, okay. well, before she so dr hilton basically what you're saying Anne, is suck it up and wear the mask okay right. listen okay. It, i mean honestly it is it, it's one our stay our stay our stay home if it really is one of those things i understand that people do have anxiety and i don't make light of that i know people have claustrophobia i don't make light of it uh, at all but what I am telling you, though, is that if you go out and Lord forbid, if two of you meet that don't want to wear a mask together and one of you cough and the other one inhales, you both share the same process now. You're now joined for life in a way that, that may cost you your life and it is not worth it. So if you can even tie a loose bandana around you some type of way, um, just something to kind of to act as some sort of barrier um, is better than nothing. So I do want to encourage um, the people that say that if they practice, if they have not worn masks before, wear it at home and increase the time that you can try. So wear it at home for like four or six hours. Practice slow, deep breaths because you're right. It's a lot of anxiety when you have the mask, but get used to it at home before you go out and try to spend a whole day. Right. And just kind of build your tolerance up because like you said, Dr. Hilton, we've been wearing masks since forever. 
We've lived. We haven't passed out. You too can do it. It just takes practice. <laughs> all right. All right, ladies. We got the message. We got the message. Okay. Got a, just a couple of quick questions before we try to wrap up here at two o'clock, just for some clarification. At this point, do we know once you've gotten COVID-19, can you get it again or are you now immune? Yes or no? Do we know? No, you're not immune. Right. We, we don't know that you're immune. So, you know, if you get it, you still need to be careful. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, there's a study and I can try to find this study. I'm, I'm all about studies because I feel like we do a lot of talking. Um, so I just put a link in the, in the um, chat of where you can scroll through and see the, um, the slope. I couldn't, for whatever reason, wouldn't let me put, post just a picture. But as far as the um, antibodies, there was a study that just came out um, where they were looking at people who had known confirmed COVID-19 and they wanted to see did, when did they start developing antibodies and then for how long are those antibodies present? And this is where it gets tricky because they found that the neutralizing antibody, which is basically the antibodies that um, when you see the virus that it's able to kind of kill and eradicate the virus before it really has a chance to take effect, where they were only present for six to eight weeks afterwards only for a month and a half to two months. Now, what does that mean then for, for vaccines? That's my question, because what we mm -hmm. do with vaccines is we give you a small dose of some piece of the virus so your body can recognize that virus. Um, and, and, and when I say piece of the virus, because I know these conspiracy theorists are gonna say, oh, they're giving me a virus. No, it's not, it's not that. That's not what we do. Um, but what, the, what it's supposed to do is to trigger your body's immune system to say, hey, if you see anything that even resembles something that looks like this, react to it so you can destroy the virus before it has a chance to cause you to have this overwhelming um, inflammatory response system. Now, the problem with this is if our bodies, if we're seeing people who have COVID, they have the full virus, this is what it looks like. And if they only have antibodies present in their bodies for six to eight weeks, then what is it, how does that bode for us being able to, even if we have a good working vaccine, that is going to give us long lasting um, impact to be able to, yeah, to, to, to have it, these antibodies floating in our system readily. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be tricky and challenging, which again pushes us then as a nation to be able to say, okay, if our bodies aren't responding in a normal way, if, if people who have COVID-19 aren't responding with antibodies that last for a year, two years to give them coverage, then we have to somehow slow the spread down of this virus to a point that it no longer has another person to, to interact with, just that it can kind of kill itself out. But if we're interacting and spreading it from person to person to person to person, then then we're, we're not going to get to that point. Um, and, and herd immunity cannot be relied on based on what the study shows. So I'll try to find that study right now. All right. And then there's the point where this is similar to the flu, right? So even with the flu, there's a different flu vaccine every flu season. So even if we create a vaccine, is it that is the the vaccine for this particular type of coronavirus because we hear, you know, so you get a vaccine for this one particular type, but then now there's another type that is the most active form. And, and we, we don't know what we don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, doctors, with the few minutes that we have left, are you encouraged based on what you're seeing now? We're starting to see more treatments available. You're starting to understand how to better treat people who have this disease. Are you encouraged by what you are seeing? No, not in the outpatient arena. No, because <laughs> we don't have anything to offer anyone in the outpatient arena. And I am managing, a, you know, 20, 30 people with COVID right now at home. And we're trying to keep them out of the hospital. But we don't have anything to offer. And I, the reason why I'm not encouraged um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a fatal optimist. I always try to say like, okay, well, we can do this. The reason what, what dampens my, um, my optimism is that people are just being reckless. I mean, it's, it's one of these things of it's a defiant, um, you, won't, you won't force me to wear this mask, even if it means that the child that is 
my own child is going to get sick. It's, it's one of those things I cannot understand it for the life of me, as if we didn't have the 1918 pandemic to, to mirror ourselves off, that we saw a first wave and then a huge second wave that was really the cause of the mass fatalities that we saw. Um, and, and that's what scares me. We're not looking at remote history and we're not looking at recent history of, like I said, what has come before us in Italy and France and Germany and South Korea. Um, we're not even looking at recent history of what has happened in New York City, um, you know, <laughs> and, and, New Orleans. Um, and we're repeating the same things that have happened in those now in Florida, now in Arizona, now in Texas, now in California, um, Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina. I mean, our numbers are, are jumping in leaps and bounds. I think they, you said, um, Ms. McGill, that um, seven kids right now are being treated at MUSC. I don't, I don't work there anymore, so I can't, uh, I don't know. Um, but we're, we're not following what, what has clearly happened and we're putting our heads in the sand and saying, oh, this isn't real, but it is. Um, and until we get this right, we're going to have a crippling of our economic situation because we're just delaying and delaying and delaying when we can actually truly open. We see now in Texas and in parts of Florida, they're going back to phase one again, right? Um, it makes no sense. Do what we have to do, stop the spread of the virus so that we can once and for all be able to open. But the longer we sit here and and throw tantrums as if we're teenagers where our mom said we can't go to this party, right? Wear your mask, stop the spread so we can get back to normal life. That's, mm -hmm. That's a good end. All right, doctors, we are about to end. So I'll give each of you 30, 45 seconds for any uh, final thoughts that you want to share with our audience this afternoon before we wrap up at two o'clock. Well, Johns Hopkins this week has identified Charleston as the number one hotspot in the nation. We're finally number one in something. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not something good. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like Dr. Hilton just said, wear a mask, um, but stay home. I mean, I, I think sometimes we can talk ourselves into believing that this is okay. It's okay for me to do this. I know I should stay home, but it's okay for me to do this. And so, no, it, it's not okay. Um, do what you absolutely must do. If you must go to work, if you must go to the grocery store, but everything else should be non-negotiable. There, there's no real reason that you should have to go to somebody's wedding. As much as you would like to go to that, no, send them a gift. <laughs> and stay home. Um, so, and that's hard. And I know we've been doing this for months now and it really is hard when, especially when we see other people doing it, we convince ourselves, oh, it must be okay. But trust me, somebody at that wedding is gonna test positive. And then there's gonna be mass hysteria over that. And then there's gonna be other people who are gonna get sick over that. So just don't do it, say no, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Blunt. I would just say the time is always right to do the right thing. It's always better to be overly cautious and safe than reckless and dead. Do what you got to do to keep yourself safe. And this is not a racial thing. It's not an economic thing. This is a health thing. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right. I guess Dr. Hilton, any closing thoughts? Yeah, um, just that, like I said, that... Um, just guess we're following the numbers, but don't only just follow the mortality rate and think that everything is okay. Know that you can also have um, people in the recovered group that are just as sick for the rest of life. Um, and just asking people not to be selfish. This mm -hmm. In this time of life, if we can all not be selfish or narcissistic in our practices and, and think of only of me, 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 and I am okay, so I should be able to do this and I want my job to do this. Um, that's not how work life works and people are dying um every single number of one was someone's son or daughter at bare minimum and um and you don't want it to be your your child next and you don't want it to be your family member next um lord forbid hopefully this will all just go away but it won't go away until we all do our individual parts so let's put our differences aside um Let's not worry about if we are voting for who and, and who we like. This isn't a um, 
a popularity contest. You don't get a superlative at the end of the school year. Um, it really is just about making wise decisions as adults so we can do what's best for, for our children that are following us. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to thank uh, Goodstock Consulting, Louis B. and Company Consulting for putting together this fabulous panel for us this afternoon. We always, always appreciate working with you all. Thanks to uh, my managers here at Live 5 News again for allowing us uh, to do one of these town halls to address some issues and to hear from our local professionals and our regional professionals. Um, want to let those of you know who are local that right now starting at 2 o'clock from 2 until 4 at Royal Missionary Baptist Church, there is a grocery giveaway, fresh fruits and veggies from Florida, as well as meats, canned goods. Um, they are staying safe. All you have to do is pull up, pop your trunk. A church volunteer will load the box into your trunk, and you can stay safe and be on your way. Uh, they usually have enough boxes for between about five and 700 folks, so there is plenty and um, they want to help you out if you need some help putting food on the table. Uh, the church plans to do this every Wednesday at this time, two to four, this entire month to help out because during this time, we have to help our neighbors. Thank you all doctors for being with me this afternoon and um, stay safe and uh, thank you for your sacrifices and going to work every day to be there to treat uh, all of us who unfortunately may end up with this disease and maybe we'll have another panel in a couple of weeks ago to, and another couple of weeks to see how things are going. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.